in every generation, there's got to be a man or a woman that throws caution to the wind and says, God told me to do this. God told me to do this. And it doesn't matter what anybody says about the odds. Mario, you know how big Sacramento is? Not bigger than God. You know how big the evil is? Not bigger than God. You know how big the gangs are? Not bigger than God. And Jonathan had it right. Perhaps the Lord will work with us. For there is nothing restraining God. So they ran. And they kept swinging that sword. And Philistines began to understand that something they could not explain was going on. And the first group, the first group that got it were mercenaries, thousands and thousands of mercenaries who, who left their Jewish faith to join Philistia. And suddenly they saw their brethren. And the Bible tells us they tore off the insignia of Philistia, drew their swords, and came back from their ways to fight alongside of their brethren. And I'm going to tell you something. The backslider is coming back to the house of God. Yeah, they are. They're going to tear off the colors of the world. And they're going to say, I know those Christians. Those Christians that are the freedom fighters that are standing against tyranny. I remember when church was like that. And tears are going to break. I'm going back to God. I'm going to serve God. Your children are coming back. Your husband is coming back. Your backslidden mate is coming back. They're going to come back. And then something else is going to happen. Saul was sitting under a tree with 600 soldiers. And they weren't in the battle. They were scared of the Philistines. They didn't have but one sword, and Saul had it. And then they heard a noise out on the plain. And somebody, somebody came, and Saul said, What is that noise that I hear? He said, that's your son fighting the Philistines by himself. Without your permission, without a board vote, without the denomination approving it, without... He just went out and did it. And then... What did that do? First, it provoked the backsliders to get back in the army. Now, Saul comes into reality. My own son is fighting, and I'm standing here trying to manage the, so the store. I'm trying to be an administrator. I'm trying to be a counselor. I'm trying to be an emotional support dog. He said, everybody, get up. Get up and let's go fight alongside of my son right now. And they ran to the battle. And then God got so happy, he threw in an earthquake. Well, there's a backslider. There's the compromised preacher. But there's another group. The group that decided to hide because of the virus. 
I can't go there. That China flu gets me, it'll be bad. So I'm going to watch from home. I ain't going to the house of God. So here's where they were described in verse 22. All the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim, they hid in rocks and caves and in the thicket. When they heard that the Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them. And here we are going to read verse 23, but you've got to earn verse 23. You know, just like Michael Jordan earned number 23, you've got to earn verse 23. You've got to earn it. You've got to clear your throat. You've got to get rid of your ways. You've got to get rid of your sin and your compromise and your unbelief and your fear. And you've got to realize that when the sun went up that morning, there was no hope. When the sun went up that morning, a nation that had down to two swords because the NRA had been disbanded and the Second Amendment had been removed, that they had no weapon. So it was possible for this onslaught of politicians to just take over everything. And you know what happened that morning? Something happened to Jonathan when he woke up and he said, what in the world is wrong with me? Why am I living in fear and in resignation of my future being decided by atheists, devil worshipers? I may be ready for verse 23. It says this, so God saved Israel that day. So God saved Israel that day. And I'm going to talk to you for a moment. To your everlasting shame, many of the modern preachers that call California home and have got their little, their cubicle mega church would have condemned the actions of Jonathan. Living in his day, he would have been a rebel, a renegade. But in these citadels of religious nothingness, there is no plan to save anybody. There's no plan to do anything but lay down and be a collaborator with the most wicked re reinvention of morals and life that the world has ever seen. The experiment, the sludge, the sewage, backing up on us out of the pipes that are attached to the Capitol building in Sacramento are unforgivable. It's unforgivable. It is no version of it we can accept. There's no time for us to look at it. Right now it is a time for the spirit of Jonathan to get on us, to say we will rise up and God will work with us. One of my heroes is David Wilkerson. I have four large photographs in my office, framed. One is Oral Roberts. The other is Billy Graham. The third is Miss Catherine Kuhlman. And the fourth is David Wilkerson. And everyone's smiling up there in that gallery except David. And David was in my life. David was the reason I was called to the ministry. And while he was alive, he was vilified. Now you look on his videos on YouTube and they're all viral. Everything he said, how in one day New York would be shut down. But convicting preaching, repentance preaching, it's, it's gone. 